news anchor and host with China Global Television Network. I was a former Washington correspondent for CCTV. And before that, I was one of you guys actually um, working for the Associated Press as a news intern 15 years ago. Now, I would like to begin by acknowledging the distinguished panel of guests and panelists with us today, joining us online and here on site. They are Mr. Liu Yucheng, Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs of China. <clears throat> Eric Lee is Vice Chairman of the China Forum at Center for International Security and Strategy at Tsinghua University. And Professor Zhang Weiwei is Dean of Fudan University's China Institute. Also joining us online, we have Kishore Mabubani, Distinguished Fellow at the Asia Research Institute from National University of Singapore. Welcome, sir. Also Martin Jakes, former Senior Fellow at the Department of Politics and International Studies at Cambridge University. Hi, Martin. And last but not least, John Ross, former Director of Economic and Policy, Business Policy for the Mayor of London. Now, without further ado, welcome, John. Without further ado, I would like to invite Chinese Vice Foreign Minister, Mr. Liu Yucheng, to say a few words. Let's welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, distinguished friends. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank our panelists, <laughs> uh, Mr. Zhang Weiwei and Li Shimo, to join us. And also, my thanks go to my friend in UK, uh, Martin Jack, uh, John Ross, who have to get up so early this morning <coughs> because of time difference. And my special warm greetings to Kishore Malbani, my old, old friend. <coughs> We acquainted in New York 20 years ago. So I haven't seen them for quite a long time because of the pandemic. I hope they are all well. <clears throat> uh, I'm back to the topic, today's topic. First of all, I'd like to, I very, I'm very glad to join you again in this dialogue. Recently, democracy is being widely discussed around the world. This should have been a good thing. But a very few countries are using democracy as a cover. They twist its essence and willfully set its standards. They even take democracy as a political tool for selfish gains and build small blocks to create this division and confrontation in the world and build small blocks. <clears throat> so this obviously runs against the spirit of democracy. Therefore, I believe today's dialogue on democracy is very necessary. Through our interaction, we hope to clear up confusion, promote right conceptions, and look for the right way of democracy. I wish to share with you some of my points and The first question I'd like to answer is, is China a democracy or not? <clears throat> some in the West claim that there seems to be no democracy in China and that the Communist Party of China is just authoritarian and autocratic. In their eyes, although China has created many miracles of long-term stability, rapid development, and poverty reduction. And the government has the universal support of the Chinese people. Yet, China is still a country without democracy and without human rights. This actually reveals their hostile mindsets and intentions, namely, democracy is just a tool to repress anyone who disagrees with them and to contain the development of other countries. 
This year marks the 100th birthday of the CPC. For 100 years, China has never stopped its efforts to pursue and advance democracy. I think many people may have watched the Age of Awakening, a very popular TV series. I like it very much, personally. I was deeply impressed by one of the scenes. Chen Duxiu, Li Dazhou, and other CPC founders walking back and forth on a multi path in the early 20th century, looking for ways to democracy and freedom for China. Starting from that muddy path, the CPC led the Chinese people on a great journey of the century. In the early 1930s, the CPC established the Congress of Workers, Peasants and Soldiers in Rijin, capital of the Chinese Soviet Republic. While in Yan'an, peasants who could not read would vote for their ideal candidates. How to vote? By casting beans as ballots. U.S. journalist Edgar Snow was deeply impressed by his visit to Yan'an. He said what he saw there was the best of human history and a light of rejuvenation in the East. After the founding of the People's Republic, China's democracy has stepped into a new stage and made steady and historical progress. In particular, since the 18th CPC National Congress, the Party Central Committee with Comrade Xi Jinping at its core has deepened the knowledge of the laws of democracy and proposed the important concept of her process people's democracy. This is a major innovation on the people's democratic system. Socialist democracy with Chinese characteristics is now in the new era. Many of my colleagues and friends who hope to see a sequel to the age of awakening, I would ask them, don't you think the prosperous democratic China today is the best sequel? Our forefathers' dream of democracy is now a reality. And the whole process people's democracy is the best answer to their lifelong struggle. China's democracy is not for the few or an interesting group. It is for the majority and the whole Chinese people. All the 2,620,000 deputies in the five levels of People's Congresses, from the National People's Congress down to provinces, cities, countries, counties, and townships, are elected by people. The people in China participate extensively in state affairs, especially local level governance to exercise their constitutional rights. China's democracy is not a show or a formality. It truly makes the people happy and improves their well-being. In the past decades, more than 800 million Chinese have been lifted out of abject poverty, a miracle unseen anywhere in the world. China has also built the world's largest social security system and healthcare system, covering more than 1.3 billion people. Jobs are the most important part of people's well-being. More than 10 million new jobs were created each year for 15 consecutive years, a number equivalent to the population of a mid-sized country. So far, 1.08 billion Chinese have been fully vaccinated against COVID, and community workers in the 600,000 communities across China are keeping up to speed everyone's vaccination. China's democracy is not the kind 
that wakes up at the time of voting and goes back to dormant afterwards. Instead, it ensures that the Chinese people have the full right to know, to express, and to supervise. It means that the people participate in every part of democracy. From the people to the people, this is an important way of China's democratic practice. All major law-making decisions in China are the result of a democratic process. Since the 18th CPC National Congress, the public has been called on to comment on 187 draft laws. Around 1.1 million comments were collected, with more than 3 million suggestions. When drafting the 14th five-year plan, the Chinese government also asked the public for advice. On the internet alone, the government received more than 1 million proposals. So both history and reality have fully proved that China's model of democracy fits in well with its national conditions. It enjoys the support of the mass people. It is real, effective, and successful democracy. China is indeed, no doubt, a true democracy. That muddy path in the early 20th century has become a broad, straight road leading Chinese people to greater democracy, freedom, and better lives. China's success in democracy highlights an important lesson, that is, transplanted democracy does not work, and countries should not be lectured about how to build their own democracy. In other words, for democracy to succeed in a country, it must take deep roots in that country and make its own people happy and satisfied. We in China often say that language dialects change every 10 miles and folk customs differ every 100 miles. <laughs> Even on the Chinese territory, there are many different features. The rich plains in the northeast and the dry yellow west, northwest. The wet south and the immense grasslands north. Different soils produce different crops and cultures. And that is also true with the diverse world, with so many different countries. As the saying goes, that personality is shaped by the environment. <coughs> Democracy should also be molded by the conditions on the ground. No two leaves in the world are completely the same. Likewise, a one-size-fits-all model of democracy for the whole world does not exist. There is no democracy, democratic system, that can claim to be perfect or superior to others. If you look at China's path to democracy in modern times, you will see that we suffered a lot and paid a heavy price by simply copying the models from other countries. If you look at the world, be it in Afghanistan, Libya, or Iraq, democracy imposed through color revolutions all ended in catastrophe. And at the, at the end of the day, it is the innocent people that bear the brunt. Friends, our world is going through a serious pandemic and, a deep, and deep changes unseen in a century. Humanity faces unprecedented risks and challenges. Now more than ever, the world needs to come together and respond collectively. And a, a certain country is putting together the so-called democratic summit as self-styled leader of democracy. It divides countries into different levels of a hierarchy, labels them as democratic or undemocratic, and points fingers at other countries' democratic systems. It claims it is doing this for democracy. 
But this is, in fact, the very opposite of democracy. It will do no good to global solidarity, no good to cooperation, and no good to development. <clears throat> in essence, democracy needs to be in touch with the people. It needs to keep in mind what people want, what their needs are, and how to make their lives better. Democracy is not to be put on a pedestal. It is not about grandstanding, and it should not be out of touch with the general public. In today's world of uncertainties, fighting COVID-19 remains a top priority. The coronavirus has claimed over 5.2 million lives worldwide, and the U U.S. alone lost over 800,000 lives to COVID. This is heart-wrenching. This tragedy must not continue. According to the WHO, more than 80 countries are still unable to vaccinate 40 percent of their adults by the end of this year. Many of them are African countries. What is worse, the new and formidable variant Omicron is now posing a severe threat to the African people. To help address these challenges, China has been providing assistance to people in Africa. At the recent FOCUC Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, President Xi Jinping announced major steps in support of Africa, including another 1 billion doses of vaccines to African countries, 10 medical and health projects, and 1,500 medical personnel and public health experts. In addition to COVID-19, we also face many other challenges, including climate change, inflation, energy security, and refugees and migrants. The clock is ticking for all countries to work together to find a solution. Let us return to what democracy is really about. Get in touch with the people and do more to improve their lives. So with that, I conclude my remarks, which I hope would be useful for your discussions. I wish this dialogue is a full success. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now, thank you very much, uh, Vice Minister Le, for that uh, thorough introduction of China's view, the view of the Chinese government on what democracy is and the, that definition or a redefinition, rather, of what Beijing believes is true democracy. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for taking time off your busy schedule to address this forum. Of course, around the world, democracy varies from regions, religions, and cultures. One of my favorite politicians, Li Kuang Yu, once said, the ultimate test of a political system is whether it improves the standard of living for the majority of people, which inspires the question we're discussing today. What is more important? form of government or effectiveness of governance? Should we take a hard look at some of the things that we have been taken for granted, such as what is democracy, or rather, what should democracy be truly about? And for that, we have an exciting panel of experts on that. To start off, I would like to invite Mr. Kishore Mabubani, Distinguished Fellow at the Asia Research Center from National University of Singapore, he published a book last year, and his name is Has China Won, in case you haven't read it. Um, Mr. Mabubani, full is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, anyways, I want to first begin by thanking uh, Vice Minister Le for his very warm words of welcome. It's very good to meet virtually, even though we cannot meet physically, and I'm also very happy to be connected with my friends, uh, Eric Lee, Chang Weiwei, Martin Jacques, and uh, across the, this virtual realm. It's good to see you all. And I'm glad you cited uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew uh, in your uh, remarks, because I mean, in a sense, I'm gonna build on what, what you just quoted from him. When he said the test uh, of a political system 
is whether or not it improves the lives of the majority of people. At the end of the day, that's the real test of a political system. And here, the key, my message, to put it very simply, and, and you will find, I, I confess to you, you'll find a lot of the data. I'm going to use a lot of some data you, in case you're wondering where to get the data. The data is taken from chapter seven of my book, uh, Has China Won? And I'm happy to announce it's also been published in Chinese now. I think the title is a bit different, China's Choice. But in chapter seven, you'll find all the data that I'm citing today because I don't have PowerPoints to share them with you. And the main case I'm going to make to you is that the country that claims clearly that it is a mothership of democracy is the United States of America. And, I'm, and I'll say for many decades, the United States was in many ways the, uh, the, the goal set, the gold standard for democracy in many areas. But in recent times, clearly, the United States is not functioning as a democracy it is functioning as a plutocracy, and I'll explain that. And I can tell you that many Americans themselves feel that something has gone wrong with their democracy. And just, by the way, just yesterday, literally, I mean, just 24 hours ago, the Harvard University Kennedy, Institute, Kennedy School Institute of Politics came out with a new poll showing that 52%, 52%, more than half of the young people in the U.S. believe that the country's democracy is either in trouble or a failed democracy. And only 7% said that democracy in the United States is healthy. And I would say this poll from the Harvard Kennedy Institute of Politics is a very significant warning sign because quite often, young people can see things more clearly than old people like me can. And you know, you know the old fable, right, of the child who could see that the emperor was wearing no clothes. That's an old Western fable, Aesop's fable. So in the same way, you also find that if the young people can see through uh, very clearly what the fundamentally, what has fundamentally gone wrong, let's say in the American political system. And, and the key point I want to make is that while you may think that this may be just a temporary downturn uh, in the performance of uh, American democracy, it actually may be much more serious. And my case is that it's become a structural problem. And just, just let me read a few sentences from uh, uh, chapter seven of my book. What I say is under the surface guise of a functioning democracy, with all the rituals of voting, America has become a society run by money aristocracy that uses its money to make major political and social decisions. And this is the difference between a democracy and a plutocracy. A democracy is a government of the people, by the people, for the people. A plutocracy is a government of the 1%, by the 1%, for the 1%. And that's, that's what the plutocracy is. And what is actually quite shocking about this uh, development in the United States is that America's greatest political philosopher in the last 100 years is a man I actually met in Harvard. His name is John Rawls, and I wrote my master's thesis uh, explaining the concepts of freedom and equality in the writing of John Rawls. And John Rawls said this in a very prescient fashion. 50 years ago, he said this, John Rawls said this. He said, the liberties protected by the principle of participation lose much of their value whenever those who have greater private means, repeat, whenever those who have greater private means are permitted to use their advantages to control the cause of public debate, unquote. So if money can control public debate, then money will take over the decision making. And, 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 and unfortunately, the one, one decision that the Supreme Court made that was disastrous 
was a decision that is known as Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission in 2010. And that decision basically said, this is a rough summary, that money has the right to free speech. So just as human beings have a right to free speech, money has the right to free speech. And the result of that and, and is that that was the critical step towards creating a plutocracy instead of a democracy. And somebody else who said this is somebody very distinguished, you've all heard of him, uh, Martin Bull from the Financial Times said, and I quote him in this, uh, in this chapter, he says that the Supreme Court's perverse 2010 Citizens United decision held that companies are persons and money is speech. This has proved a big step on the journey of the US towards becoming a plutocracy. And if you have any doubts that money has taken charge of the political system, there are very serious academic studies that document how money has taken charge. And in particular, I cite two Princeton University professors, Martin Guidance and Benjamin Page. And what they say, and they measure, they, they are very careful measurements about whose preferences are reflected in the decisions made by the US Congress and US pub public institutions. And their conclusions, which they say, and I quote, the preferences of economic elites have far more independent impact in the, on, on policy change than the preferences of average citizens do. And their conclusion, therefore, is this. Eh? In the United States, our findings indicate the majority does not rule. Maybe I should repeat that. In the United States, our findings indicate the majority does not rule, at least not in the causal sense of actually determining policy outcomes. So they say that while you have all the processes of democracy, like regular elections, freedom of speech and association, and all that, makes no difference. At the end of the day, the decisions do not reflect the wishes of the majority, the decisions reflect the wishes of a minority, and therefore that is a plutocracy and not a democracy. And of course, going back to the point that Mr. Lee Kuan Yew made, that you cited, and he said that, out, that the test of a system is whether or not it improves the livelihoods of the majority of people. But that hasn't happened. And another, another writer, Anand Giridharadas, a former New York Times columnist, has said, and these are his figures. The average pre-tax income of the top 10 of Americans has doubled since 1980. That of the top 1% has tripled. And that of the top 0.001% has risen more than sevenfold. And at the same time, the bottom 50% have not seen any improvement in their standard of living. So if you go by what Mr. Lee Kuan Yew said, if the test of a democracy is whether or not it improves the livelihoods of the majority of the people, there is overwhelming data that shows that the, that the livelihood of more than 50% of Americans have stagnated for 30, over 30 years, and the top 0.01% uh, 0 0.01% have taken everything. So the net result of this, therefore, is that the United States which used to be, I would, I would argue, a strong, healthy, functioning democracy has functionally become a plutocracy. And really, we need to understand what has gone wrong there, because if this is going to be the model of the rest of the world, then we have a problem. Why don't I stop here? I've, I've, I've used up my 10 minutes, and I want to thank you very much for inviting me to make this contribution. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Mabubani. You brought up the concept plutocracy, uh, actually reminding me of my days uh, in Washington as a journalist. One of the first assignments of mine was to go to the Supreme Court of the U.S. Uh, and cover their U Citizens United uh, ruling. Uh, was a split decision by the U U.S. Supreme Court, which eventually allowed, uh, basically allowed unlimited spending towards political campaigns by you know, corporations and special interests. 
uh, and uh, that really gave rise to super PACs. So one could ask the question that uh, for average Joe in America or average Jane, uh, how democratic is that? Um, all right, thank you very much, uh, Professor Mabubani, once again for your speech. Um, Eric, I'm curious about really uh, your view on this very important subject um, of democracy. Thank you, thank you, Kisho. Thank you, Wang Guan. Um, thanks for having me here. I'm a businessman, so I'm not an expert. Um, so today, I wanted to focus more about uh, democracy, uh, and we'll talk about China a little bit too. Um, you know, we're having this discussion at a it seems to me at a precarious time for democracy. Um, there are a lot of rumors swirling around the globe that democracy is in trouble. Okay, Kishore just summarized some of the rumors. Um, Kishore, I hope it's fake news that democracy is in trouble. <laughs> okay, but the coverage has been relentless and data is mounting. Okay, uh, in addition to what Kishore cited, um, I just summarized this morning, Freedom House, uh, in their most recent report this year, said global decline in democracy has accelerated. In addition, it says U.S. democracy has declined significantly. Okay. VDAM, this outfit in Sweden, uh, also says their surveys show a global decline in democracy. And, and interestingly, it says U.S. aligned nations decline the most for some reason. Okay. Larry Diamond. Uh, who is one of the most senior democracy scholars in the world, uh, have been complaining about what he called democratic recession for many years, and recently has just upgraded that to a crisis, crisis level. Okay. Now, none other than President Biden, who you t this year uh, said many things, he said that, uh, uh, implied that the president of China is betting democracy can't keep up with autocracy. And, 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 and they must prove China wrong, he said. Uh, in his address to the first joint session of Congress, um, he said that this point in history is about whether or not democracy can function in the 21st century. He said, can we act in the framework needed to compete with autocracy? And I must say there's a, almost like a whiff of despair in such proclamations. Now, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of China when I was growing up, right after the Cultural Revolution, you know, we were in deep trouble. And our leaders and our elites were saying, oh my God, time is running out. We've got to prove socialism works. <laughs> you know, how, how do we prove socialism works better than capitalism? We're in trouble. Okay. So it's, it's a precarious moment, and it's a confusing moment. You know, I, I got a slide I made yesterday to show you. Can somebody put it up? Okay. Tunisia, um, this one country, all right, it, it, that's where the Arab Spring began, as we know, as the Jasmine Revolution, okay? So before, it was characterized as a dictatorship, of, of course. So according to the Freedom House, look at that, 2000, before the Arab Spring, not democratic, not free, red, red, bad, okay? And then, of course, Jasmine Revolution, the scores have improved to part, partly free. Then it got even better. Oops, okay, all green light going on. You know, looking really good for Tunisia, right? According to the Freedom House, democracy is triumphing. Yet, look at that. The people in Tunisia are miserable. They hate it. As the Freedom House numbers show improvements, significant improvements, the people of Tunisia are suffering. Their views are opposite. You know, what is going on here, right? Now, this is from Pew Research, and they stopped collecting data at 2016. Uh, I don't know why.
Obama many years ago. Uh, and I think it's this April when Francis wrote an opinion piece on Wall Street Journal um, saying that, uh, you know, talking about lamenting the rigidity, what he calls rigidity of the U.S. system. So our next speaker is Professor Zhang Weiwei, Dean of Fudan University's China Institute. His new book, China Now, What is Democracy? Um, is presented outside, if it is of any interest to you. Professor Zhang, please. So, okay. so thank you, Wang Guan, and thank you for the press call for coming to this uh, fascinating discussion on the issue of democracy. So I will make a short presentation with PowerPoints Basically, the title is Democracy, China versus United States. As we all know, uh, democracy is controversial in many ways. If you ask Americans whether China democracy, many of them will say, no, it's autocracy. If you ask Chinese, most Chinese today will tell you, America's democracy is monetocracy. Money determines everything. So whether given this kind of controversy, we can have a kind of the, uh, intellectual discussion on the issue of democracy. So I'm thinking of whether we can use a kind of working definition. I would like to quote the famous line from Abraham Lincoln, government of the people, by the people, for the people. And then I try to compare China and United States, item by item, to see which democracy is a genuine democracy and which democracy is better. Now, interestingly, we have just received this uh, in, uh, uh, fascinating result conducted by Dahlia Research uh, concerning the issue of democracy. In the case of China, 13% people surveyed say their government serves a minority. In other words, more than 80% believe their government works for the vast majority of Chinese population. In the United States, 52% say their government serves a minority. Most people, more than half, believe their government serves a minority. And then, this is the study by Dr. Zhong Nanshan, very famous in China. He said just a few days ago, uh, if you live in China today, in terms of freedom from contracting the COVID-19 or from the COVID-related deaths, China today is at least 606 times safer and freer from COVID-related deaths and 1,679 times safer from contracting the disease. This calculation is very simple. If you look at the figure for death toll, of the COVID-19. The United States is roughly 170 times of China's in terms of absolute figure. And the China's population is 4.2 times that of the United States. So China is more than 600 safer and freer from deaths relating to COVID-19. And then look at this median net household assets. Um, indeed, you know, Four decades ago, China was way behind the United States in terms of uh, uh, personal well-being, wealth, etc. But today we can make a very interesting comparison. Uh, this is about net household assets. There is two colors for the average family uh, level. In that case, the United States is higher than the Chinese. But in the median, the figure is totally different. If you look at the United States in 2019, it's closer to 100,000 US dollars per household at median level. So in Chinese yuan, it's close to uh, 700,000. Uh, uh, now, in the case of China, it's slightly more than double that of the United States. Of course, the figure I use is for urban households. We don't have uh, rural families. So far, we haven't got that figure yet. Hopefully, by next year, we're going to have one, and then we can make things 
By the way, uh, if you look at the rising living standard in the countryside, it's also uh, rising faster than we expected. And then, of course, this famous PEW surveys, which you can check back five years ago, 10 years ago, and today. So in that case, 91% Chinese surveyed believe China is on the right track. 41% believe the United States is on the right track. For the UK, I'm sorry, 21%. For France, 20%. There must be a lot of violation of human rights in these countries, given so many people are not happy with the direction of the country. So these are figures surveyed, conducted by reputable international institutions. So I'll say with certainty, concerning for the people, the Chinese model, Chinese political system, or Chinese democracy had delivered and done much, much better than the US model. Now concerning of the people, I'll just give you one figure, 90% roughly, Chinese civil servants come from ordinary background. And uh, if you look at the remark by Joseph Stiglitz, Nobel laureate, he said, you know, I see it now, of the 1%, by the 1%, for the 1%. As most people agree, it's a country for the rich. Yeah. And uh, then by the people, that's where most controversy occurs. In the Western political discourse today, uh, indeed, multi-party system, universal suffrage, uh, itself would mean you know, government by people. Uh, yet, from Chinese point of view, this is, as Eric just mentioned, it's about institutional procedures. It's at the best procedural democracies. Procedures and the substance may be same, may be very different. So the Chinese approach is always first focus on explore substance. And then procedures will take shape. We have a traditional philosophy since ancient times. It's called the Tao and the Shu. Tao means overall objectives, overall purpose, overall principles that governs Shu, governs procedures. That's also one way why China can carry out reforms, while many so-called liberal democracy cannot, because they are very rigid with procedures. And then, if you look at the substantial democracy, the Chinese approach can be called uh, to ensure good governance for the people. That's very important. So I submit this thesis a long time ago, I think 15 or 20 years ago, I said we need to have a paradigm shift. Uh, shift from what's called a democracy versus autocracy, and democracy, autocracy, as defined by the West and the West only, to good governance versus bad governance. What's substantial democracy? It means to ensure and achieve good governance. That's the primary objective. And China has been doing that and rather successful. Again, uh, if you look at the same research from Dahlia Research, uh, it, interesting, it's the issue of so-called democracy deficits. In the case of China, 84% people surveyed think democracy is important. 73% view their country, China, as democracy. So the democracy deficit is 11%. In the United States, 73% think democracy is important, and 49% only view their country as democracy. So democracy deficit is 24%. And this study is done by uh, Dahlia Research, commissioned by actually the ex-Prime Minister of Denmark, uh, Mr. Rasmussen. He's, uh, of course, you all know, uh, 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 quite hostile to Chinese political system. So that result shows a lot about how by the people cannot be really achieved, even in the eyes of most Americans. Then that's even more interesting. It's, again, a uh, study by PEW. Uh, very few in any public survey think American democracy is a good example for other countries to follow. But this is a study of uh, major countries, about 20 or so. And 51 said US democracy used to be a good example, but has not been in recent years. And slightly surprisingly, 72% of Americans don't think that US is a good model of democracy for other countries. So I think there will be 
a lot of, you know, uh, I think just now, as uh, Professor Martin Jacques mentioned, uh, United States must need a lot of courage, you know, <laughs> as if nothing has happened <laughs> without this uh, storming of Congress, whatever, Capitol Hill, and things as usual. Actually, even within the United States, many people are thinking of the issues, problem with democracy. If the summit were to be held, it seems it will be held, I hope, the number one item will be a topic. A few years ago, economists have a cover story. It's called, What's Gone Wrong with Democracy? And which quotes me as in Prophet John Wei claim, US democracy is deeply flawed. It always lacks second-rate leaders. Actually, my original remark, it's always produced third-rate leaders. Unfortunately, that happened. And by the people, the Chinese way. Uh, I would describe the Chinese Communist Party as a holistic interest party. It differs tremendously from the Western political party. It's, I would call, partial interest parties. And this holistic interest party actually is a product of China's own tradition. Uh, China was first unified in 221 BC. China is a civilizational state in the sense that it's an amalgamation of hundreds of states into one of its long history. So since China's first unification in 221 BC, China has been practicing what you may call a unified ruling entity. Otherwise, the country became ungovernable and broke apart. China practiced the American model of democracy after the Republican Revolution in 1911. And then the country degenerated into civil wars and fighting between warlords. Each war supported by certain Western powers. So this is indeed a common sense in Chinese political culture, governing a country of amalgamation of hundreds of states into one. You follow this principle, unify the ruling entity, if you prefer. China has been on the one-party system for more than 2,000 years. Yeah. So Communist Party is a continuation, an evolution, and development of that tradition. Otherwise, it will have the problem of country's disintegration. Now behind this, again, since China's long tradition of meritocracy, China invented the public civil servant examination system, the courtesy system. So today, the uh, way the China elected leaders is a system which I call selection plus election, if the US model is about election. Which model is better? I would say, you know, Chinese model is slightly better, if not much better because we elect competent leaders. If you look at the members of the political bureau, especially the standing committee, most of them uh, have already governed over 100 million people before they came to their present positions. It's a vigorous process selecting competent leaders. Most of them have worked twice as number one of a Chinese province, party secretary or governor, etc. So arguably, the Chinese leadership today is the most competent in the world. And then, it's about competence, it's about ability for reform. You know, in order to carry out reforms, I think you need to have a holistic interest party. Why in so many liberal democracies, there's no way to reform. Whoever make reform, whoever steps down, you know. The point is that you need to have overcome vested interests. Only a political institution, political force, which can represent the vast majority, holistic interest of your people, you can push for reform, to overcome reforms. And China is the expert on reform. We are conducting reforms every day, every month, every year. And uh, I think it's time for the West to think hard how to reform its political system. Otherwise, the, kind of, the system will go way down. And also, because you are a holistic institution, you can plan for the future, for next year, next five years, next 10 years, next 100, for next generation. That's definitely the advantage of Chinese political system. Now, having said, of the people, by the people, for the people, now I draw something from Chinese experience, which Abraham Lincoln did not know much about. I call it to the people <laughs> and with the people. Now, let's discuss to the people. It's mainly about decision-making process. If you compare the quality of decision-making between China and the United States, I would say Chinese decision quality is much better because we practice this democratic centrally. 
which we borrowed from the Soviet Union, but reinvented according to Chinese practice. I'll give an example how China makes its five-year plan. Roughly, it takes one year and a half in the making. In the process, you have hundreds of rounds of consultations with think tank, with experts, with general public, within the party, outside party. And uh, then if you look at this, what we call whole process democracy, not only you produce the plan, but also you have the review of the implementation of the plan. And uh, in the end, the execution of the plan. Uh, many of you are here for many years. We have, for instance, the two Lianghui, two sessions in March, and then we review the five-year plan and annual plan. And then at the end of the year, either in December or November, we have a CPC Central Committee Conference on Economic Affairs. Again, we will review that. And in each and every Lianghui, Chinese Prime Minister and his work report exactly tell you a to-do list to what extent we finished that, we have not finished that. So it's a very earnest. You compare the quality of the work report of Chinese government and the State of Union address of the American presidency, uh, the Chinese quality is much, much higher. Uh, each line and every line relate to people's daily life and people appreciate that. And for the United States, uh, just now, Kishore mentioned this uh, case study by Professor Martin Gillen and Benjamin Page. Basically, the wealthy few move policy, while the average American has little power after they're reviewing answers to 1779 survey questions asked between 1981 and 2002. So I think it's a matter of uh, ju not just electing a leader every four years. It is about decision-making process. To what extent your decision reflects the will of the people. So that's to the people. We adopt principle of from the people to the people one round. To the people, from the people another round. So we go several rounds of consultation democracy, then reach mature decision. I always uh, joke with my British friends. I said, why bother in this referendum? It's very old-fashioned. If you compare this with smartphones like 2G, we now in the age of 5G, we have to really move with changing times. Only 3% some difference, the country divided and became a huge problem. Today, even the impact is there. If we adopt a consultative democracy, democratic centralism, I can assure you, with the Chinese model, even 30% difference, we can reach consensus and move the nation forward. Lastly, with the people. That's famous line from Xi Jinping. We should stay forever with the people. That's, uh, we mean it. It's not just words, it's practice. Each party leader, political bureau member, has what's called contact points with different parts of the country, provinces. You go there regularly, uh, you produce and review their uh, situation, etc. The end of the day is we have to ensure balance between political power, social power, and power and capital, power of the capital, to ensure that this balance of the three powers will be in favor of the vast majority of the population. Otherwise, the, kind of the system will be in trouble. From my point of view, in the United States, it is a balance of the three powers in favor of the super rich. I've got one line uh, to say difference between Chinese political system and American political system. The Chinese system is very clear. The richest 100 individuals cannot dictate political bill. In the United States, the 100 rich individuals most likely can dictate White House, or even less than 100 individuals. As a result, you have all the problems. You know. So I think the United States system needs serious reforms. I'm thinking of this example. You know, I really feel deeply upset the uh, United States spent $2.3 trillion on the Afghan war. It's killing, destruction, gross violation of human rights. $2.3 trillion in the past 20 years. In the case of China, since General Secretary Xi Jinping came to power, 
we eradicated the last batch of poverty, extreme poverty, closer to 100 million people. We spend 200, it's, it's, it should be $250 billion. So it's roughly 10 times less money than U.S. spent on Afghan war. We completely finish, complete this task of ending poverty. Why the United States could not spend this $2.3 trillion on ending the poverty in the United States? Indeed, <clears throat> with this money, again, in theory, a hypothesis, uh, with the Chinese model adapted to different situations, we can wipe out global poverty, in theory at least. But this money, huge amount, spent on war, on destruction, on killing, on violation of human rights. Why so? When interpretation, which many people have, it is, everyone knows actually, I, the media should expose that, the interest, vast interest of the military industrial complex, as already mentioned in the 1950s by President Eisenhower. So the end of the United States is not Russia, not China, but the United States itself. Same West, the end of the West, not China, Russia as a country, but the West itself. The end of democracy is the particular system of democracy as it is practiced now. Lastly, <clears throat> my conclusion and a bit of memory. Uh, just now, Wang Guan mentioned my debate with Professor Fukuyama exactly 10 years ago in June 2011. It almost coincided with this uh, Arab Spring and Mubarak was toppled. And he said in this debate, China may also have a kind of Arab Spring. And I said, no chance. And I made a forecast. I said, on the contrary, Arab Spring itself will become Arab Winter. In the end, it became Arab Winter. Most people agree today. And then he said, China needs a political reform, needs a multi-party system, one person, one vote. I said, both China and United States need the political reforms. But from my study of the American political system, the U.S. political model and system needs more reforms, substantial reforms. Why? I said, because your system is a product of pre-industrial era. From this process of fighting COVID-19, we saw the no clear responsibility division of labor between the federal government and state's government. That's a huge problem for modern society. And then I also said simple-minded populism may eventually prevail in the United States. And Fukuyama was confident it will not happen in American society. And because it's a mature democracy with free media, free press, I said you are slightly bit naive. Yeah. And uh, well, on all this, I would say, you know, China has practiced people's democracy. Uh, in other words, of the people, by the people, for the people, to the people, with the people. On all five fronts, my humble view is the Chinese model and system works better and much better than the American system. As for this uh, summit for democracy, uh, I'm pretty sure, as uh, media people uh, assume, you can feel the pulse of the Chinese society. You may wish to report or not, that's another matter, yeah. Uh, indeed, I, I can assume you know, uh, tremendous joy for many Chinese, uh, especially the young generation, internet generation. It reminds me of the famous tweet uh, when this storming of the Capitol Hill occurred. The United States, if the United States saw what has happened on the Capitol Hill, United States will invade the United States to liberate the United States from the tyranny of the United States. Or another tweet, you know, that's the first coup d'etat that took place without the participation of the U.S. Embassy in Americas. Yeah. This kind of tweets will go around in Chinese internet, social media. I'm pretty sure about that. And because, indeed, for especially Chinese young generation, American democracy is increasingly a joke. As for Taiwan democracy, it's a greater joke, yeah. And uh, now, from my study of the political system, actually my debate with Professor Fukuyama, I said this already 10 years ago, 
as in the terms of political system, Chinese vision is already way beyond the American model. Yeah. Maybe I can draw an analogy which may not be very appropriate. Uh, this kind of summit for democracy is a kind of old game. Uh, uh, well, the Freedom House will measure you know, which country is making progress, which country is moving backwards, etc. It's almost like the competition between uh, in the color film industry between Fuji and the Kodak in that year. They compete fiercely with each other. But the Chinese model is more or less for the digital age. So we are really looking beyond, moving beyond. We are not bothered with that. If many country, people in the world prefer the Western model, Americans prefer the American model, we respect cho choice. But we do not envy you. Yeah. To be honest, people like us and Eric, we have some sympathy for you. You have to improve. Otherwise, uh, without reform, it will be going way down. So it's not the end of history, it's the end of the end of history. That's all the remark I offered to uh, Professor Fukuyama 10 years ago. So my conclusion remains valid. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Zhang. Uh, I think it's fair to say that you raised many interesting questions, such as uh, you, the charts you showed us about the median and, uh, median and mean incomes of Chinese and American uh, urban dwellers, uh, you know, many economists would argue that median instead of mean would be a better indicator uh, of how a, an average Joe would be doing in a country. Uh, after all, the mean numbers can be dragged up by the super rich, the one percent, uh, and also the fact that you talk about uh, state with union addresses in America. Um, I, I studied that a little bit in my new book, um, suggesting that uh, you know the state of union addresses in America. It's getting shorter, uh, crispier, fit for television. Some promises are delivered, but the fact is, uh, many of them are not, uh, you know, uh, they became state of the campaign. Really. Uh, many of them are not, uh, you know, uh, they became state of the campaign, really. Our next speaker is uh, John Ross, former director of economic and business policy for the mayor of London. John, the floor is yours. First, thank you very much for this invitation to speak. Okay. The word democracy in European languages derives from two Greek words, demos or people and kratos or rule. So democracy means literally rule by the people. Democracy is presented as integrally linked to human rights, that is people's rights. This is correct and will be used here. This reality shows that China's framework and delivery on human rights and democracy is far superior to the West's. But contrary to this fundamental concept of rule by the people, an attempt is made in the West, more accurately by liberal capitalist countries, to claim that democracy is instead defined purely in terms of certain formal and official structures which they possess. For example, parliament, the so-called division of powers, etc. This is false. The issue of democracy is about how much in reality rule by the people exists. To illustrate the real issues involved, let us start with a practical example affecting almost one-fifth of humanity, women's position in China and India. An Indian woman's life expectancy is 71. In China, it is 79.2 years. That is, a Chinese woman lives eight years longer than an Indian woman. In China, female literacy is 95%. In India, it is 65%. The risk of a woman dying in childbirth is eight times higher in India than in China. In the real world, that is for the thinking of any normal human being, therefore the real rights of a Chinese woman are far superior to those of an Indian woman. Yet according to the US concept of democracy, the ridiculous claim is made that the rights of an Indian woman are superior to those of a Chinese woman because an Indian woman lives in a parliamentary republic. Therefore, what concept leads to such an obviously unruled conclusion? Or take, or take COVID. Less than 5,000 people in mainland China have died from COVID. In the US, 778,000 people have died from COVID. 
but China's population is more than four times that of the US. If the same number of people per capita had died in China as in the US, there would be 3,390,000 Chinese people dead instead of less than 5,000. But the US claims human rights and democracy are better in the US than China. Again, what type of absurd reasoning can try to justify such a conclusion which is in violation of all the most vital facts on life and death. The issues involved in this illogical claims of the West go right back to the origins of socialism, which was developed precisely as a critique of the theory and limits of liberal parliamentary democracy. Here, I agree with almost everything that was said by the previous speakers, but if you don't mind, perhaps I can put it in a little bit more theoretical way and go back to the origins of this discussion to look at it more generally. The work in which Marx became a socialist, making his transition from a liberal democrat, is the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right of 1843. Marx showed that the real role of the state was to defend the existing property relations. At the, that time in Germany, these were approaching capitalist relations. This analysis had been fully factually confirmed by innumerable practical examples since that time. The next year in his work on the Jewish question, which I think is the most classical explanation of the differences of the myths of liberal democracy and the reality. Marx demonstrated via analysis of the position of Jews in Germany, the difference between the official and the formal claims of liberal parliamentary democracy and reality. He demonstrated that removal of formal and legal restrictions on Jews in Germany did not lead to their real equality. Marx analyzed the difference between what he termed political emancipation and what he termed human emancipation, between purely formal equality and rights in politics and the fundamental inequality and lack of rights in the real world. I just had a message said recording stopped. Okay. This so. Um, it says the recording started again. Apologise for this. This so classically, this work of Marx so classically sets out the reality of Western parliamentary democracy that it is worth quoting in detail. If I used any other words, I would simply summarise analysis that could not be put more clearly. Marx put it regarding the difference between formal and real human freedom, and the real rule of the people, that in parliamentary and liberal democracy, I quote man liberates himself from a restriction in an abstract and restricted manner. This is, while liberal parliamentary democracy proclaimed equality, this was a fiction in the real world in which human beings lived. Marx put it regarding the purely formal statements of capitalist parliamentary democracy, to quote, the state abolishes in its own way distinctions of birth, social rank, education, occupation, when it declares that birth, social rank, education, occupation are non-political distinctions. When it proclaims without regard to these distinctions that every member of the nation is an equal participant in national sovereignty. But in reality, none of these real distinctions was removed, as again to quote. Nevertheless, the state allows private property, education, occupation to act in their own way i.e. as private property, as education, as occupation, and to exert the influence of their special nature. Far from abolishing these real distinctions, the state only exists on the presupposition, presupposition of their existence. Therefore, there was a complete distinction between the myths of liberal democracy and the reality of human, being li human beings' lives. Therefore, in a classic passage, which goes to the core of the myths of liberal democracy, I quote, where the political state has attained its true development, man, not only in thought, in consciousness, but in reality, in life, leads a twofold life, a heavenly and an earthly life. Life in the political community in which he considers himself a communal being and life in civil society. He went on, the relation of the political state to civil society is just as spiritual as the relations of heaven to earth. 
The political state stands in the same opposition to civil society in the same way as religion prevails over the secular world. In his most immediate reality, in civil society, man is a secular being. In the state, on the other hand, he is a member of an imaginary community, of an illusionary sovereignty. He is deprived of his real individual life and endowed with an unreal universality. Marx showed that there was a move towards a purely formal equality of Jews in Germany, German society, but this concealed the real existing inequality. Liberal parliamentary democracy obscured this reality by defining equality and democracy in only a narrow, artificial and formal way, while ignoring the real inequalities and discriminations that existed. This situation and Marx's analysis of it later, of course, culminated in one of the greatest crimes in human history, the development of German anti-Semitism into the Nazi Holocaust. This analysis of the position of the Jews in Germany provided a model for the analysis of the real situation in liberal capitalism. It is exactly this which is shown by the difference of the position of women in China and India, or the difference in deaths from COVID. The claim by Western capitalist democracy is that women in India enjoy better human rights than women in China because of the existence of parliamentary democracy. This precisely shows the difference between what Marx termed the heavenly rights, that is the non-existent ones, and the earthly rights, the real one. Obviously the real human life of a Chinese woman, human rights, real human rights for Chinese women are far superior to those of an Indian woman. That is her real earthly life. But the theory of liberal democracy ridiculously claims that the human rights of an Indian woman are superior to those of a Chinese woman because of her heavenly life in a purely formal equality in parliamentary democracy, an equality which in reality is, does not exist. In theory, in summary, in the theory of liberal democracy, everything is standing on its head. The least important an informal and in reality non-existent equality is declared to be the most important, while the most powerful, the earthly life, is declared to be less important, precisely as the difference in real life conditions between a Chinese woman and an Indian woman shows. Socialism in China puts everything the right way up. It says that it's most fundamental that a Chinese woman should live eight years longer, that, sh that she should be literate that they should, should, have, should have a hugely lower risk of dying in childbirth. And then in China and socialism starts, what, starts from what system actually delivers this improvement in the real life of human beings. That is the conception of rule by the people and human rights is a strictly practical conception. China extends the same principle as applies to Chinese women to all aspects of society. China has lifted 850 million people out of internationally defined poverty. More, that is more than 70% of all those who have been lifted out of poverty in the world. China has raised itself from almost the world's poorest country in 1949 to moderate prosperity by its national standards and to within two to three years of being a high income economy by World Bank standards. That is China has produced in the earthly life of real human beings the greatest improvement in the conditions of life of the greatest number of people in human history. That is, China has a political system which is determined by real results. That is improvement in the real lives of people, not by formal processes. Because it is a socialist country, China's economy can be brought under rule by the people, which is excluded by a capitalist system of rule of the economy by private property. In conclusion, Naturally, the specific political form, which is secondary in the framework above, is determined by China's history. As Xi Jinping put it, the person wearing the shoe knows whether it fits or not. China's present political system, based on the leading role of the CPC, with other political parties in alliance with the overall leader, the CPC is specific to China. China does not propose it for any other country. But what China's defined is the real improvement, the real conditions of humanity, that is the real improvement of the rule by the people. That is what has been demonstrated by China's history and real social and political development. Thank you very much indeed for the invitation and for listening.
Thank you very much, John. Thank you for uh, defining, or rather defining, many of the concepts surrounding democracy. Now, I would be surprised uh, if you didn't have questions here. Um, that's why we're inviting many of you. It's a privilege to have you here, the Foreign Press Corps in Beijing. And also joining our dialogue today are the Developing Countries Press Corps, joining us online. You cannot see them here, but they are actually here, dialing into this Zoom meeting. Um, now the floor is open for questions. And uh, since I don't know all of you, I know some of you, but not all of you, please uh, tell us your name and your affiliation. That lady over there, please. Oh, um, now you my Thank you. Um, Tian from Reuters. So Chinese people can vote for the People's Congress at the local level, but as we know in China, the National People Congress answers to the party and not to the people who elects them. And party members only make up less than 10% of the country's population. How then can we say that China enjoys broad-based democracy? And how can the masses be expected to express their dissatisfaction or satisfaction of the outcomes if they have no voice, no vote, and no way of holding party leaders accountable? Thank you. Who wants to take a shot at this question? I'll do a quick one. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I've always said that Yes, there's 70, 80 million, I don't know what the latest number, 80 million uh, party members out of 1. 90 million last time I checked. 90 million out of uh, 1.4 billion. Of course, you've got to get rid of the kids. Um, so 90 million out of a, a billion, um, uh, roughly. Uh, that's, a, that's not a small group um, compared with those who call the shots in America. Uh, I call it the uh, Babylonian Trinity. You know, Wall Street, Silicon Valley, uh, and Hollywood. Uh, these three groups um, exercise outsized influence on American politics, uh, which renders voting almost meaningless. Um, and and that's those three groups put together, maybe with their nannies, maybe a million people uh, out of 300 million. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's not as simple as that. <laughs> it's, that's my point. I'm not trying to mock anybody. Uh, I'm just saying it's, com it's a complex situation. It's a com politics is a complex being. Culture is a complex being. You know, it's not like you follow procedures. So, okay, you have these elections. Elections you know, are circuses in many liberal societies. We all know that. You're a journalist. How do you not know that? Elections are circuses. Okay, so I'm not sure how they translate into people's voices being heard, let alone being acted upon. All right, Professor Zhang. Uh, maybe I can make some comment as well. Uh, the problem with your question is uh, you equate democracy with election. Uh, Chinese approach has already gone way beyond that. And as we all know, uh, election is important, but election process, as practiced in many countries, can also be manipulated. Especially today, the involvement of money, the involvement of the uh, AI technology, and also the rise of social media, all this makes election and result very puzzling, very often. Because the end of the day, the argument, the thesis is uh, each individual can make a rational choice and then uh, cast his vote or her vote. This whole assumption, people can make a rational choice. Due to this involvement of money, AI technology, social media, etc., became increasingly precarious. So the Chinese approach is much more sophisticated. We draw experience from our own history. I summarize this into selection plus election. It's indeed a better system. And if election means democracy, democracy means election. That's what we try to dispute. We think this is too naive. The system will not work in the long run. All right, next question, please. Okay, the gentleman over there. Uh, hello, uh, from the BBC. Uh, my question is that um, a lot of the discussion here has been based on comparing, say, the US and China or China and other countries. 
Um, but it seems to me that's a bit like comparing apples and oranges. And the real question should be, is China as good as it can be? Or is the US, would the US be worse or better off? I mean, if you took away democratic institutions in the US, we all know all the problems with the US. I mean, and unlike many countries for that matter, all of them. Uh, the real question though is uh, how, uh, you know, how do you move it forward? And I'll give you, I might as well give you a practical example. Uh, now we all know again about the great things in China. We've all seen them, and all the journalists have lived here for a long time. But say somebody has their house effectively stolen by a corrupt developer in cahoots with a corrupt local politician. If China had an independent judiciary, they could go to the judiciary and say, oh, I actually want the money that I deserve having my house stolen. Uh, but if the judiciary is effectively controlled by the party, well, it, you know, the chances of it upsetting a local uh, party official are significantly minimised. If there was an independent media in that area, the person could go to the local newspaper and say, my house has been stolen, uh, and they might do a story on this, which might also lead to that corrupt official losing their job and maybe them getting the money they deserve. Now, instead, we get them coming and knocking on our doors. Um, you know, foreign media. Now, why do they do that? They do that because they feel in China there are no other options for them. Uh, and so, you know, uh, maybe the question should be, instead of, I mean, obviously, I, I think anyone who thinks about this sensibly would, would not expect any country's system to be imposed on another country's system. But should the question not be, is China as accountable as it could be? Could there, and would it not be even better than it is now, were there not better systems of accountability? Um, thanks, good question. Um, so, I think we're just comparing ourselves to the US obsessively because we're just unhappy we didn't get invited to the party next week. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, let, me, let me address your, your question. I think these are really good questions. Uh, they're hypothetical questions. Of course, no one is ever as good as it can be. Everybody could do better. I mean, just that's the truth of the matter. It applies across the board to everyone, every country. Um, and China could do better, of course. Uh, China had tremendous problems just as recently as 10 years ago. Um, and, and the government has tried to tackle it very, very aggressively uh, with some success, but there's still a long way to go. I mean, I named three major problems created uh, in the era, uh, uh, in the big, you know, economic growth era uh, before uh, uh, political corruption, uh, economic inequality, and environmental degradation. Okay, so, so all these pr three problems uh, are being tackled and they still uh, exist. Um, now, as your point, hypothetical uh, scenarios about independent judiciary and, and freedom of the press, the problem is that when we look at countries that do have them, they're not delivering the kind of results that you think you say that they would deliver. Um, you know, if you look at the, 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 the examples, both in developed countries and developing countries uh, in the past couple of decades, um, you know, in, in America, obviously, um, the, the, the courts are getting very, very low approval ratings. Um, the press, freedom of the press, my God, I, in the US and, and UK, um, the, in, in recent years, you know, people, Americans and, and British, they, their trust in the media as an institution are like miserable, like 40%, 30%. And, and it's hostile to the press. Half of, more than half of Americans, 60%, 55, 60% of Americans think the press is lying to them every day. It's vitriolic, it's, it's crazy. In the UK, the number is worse. It's like 30%. Um, so, so apparently, you know, freedom of the press is not generating a lot of public trust. Yeah, but if you took it away, would it be better? Well, we don't know that. I'm just saying, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm just saying, you know, it did work before. I mean, I think it's in the last couple, couple of decades, uh, the, 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 the media, the, the, the press as an institution in liberal societies have lost tremendous trust among their peoples. So, so the best way 
to convince the Chinese to consider adopting some of these things is to make them work in their home countries where those ideas uh, came from to begin with. And that's not happening. Um, and in, in developing countries, for instance, you know, a lot of uh, study was done in Indonesia uh, after the fall of Suharto, uh, when, when free press and independent judiciary came about. It turned out independent ju judiciary led to more corruption, not less. Okay, um, I think it was Professor McIntyre from National University of Australia uh, 10 years ago conducted a study in, in Australia with all those judges and politicians. Um, uh, Indonesia went from one uh, corrupt, one corrupt uh, guy to thousands of little Suhatos. Um, so things on the ground are a lot more difficult, are a lot more nuanced, are a lot more complex uh, than people might suggest. Uh, any of the, our guests uh, joining us online wanted to jump in? Martin. Yeah, so uh, firstly, uh, uh, the gentleman from the BBC, I mean, I just want to say this, that uh, the BBC's coverage of China is very stilted and biased. But I must say, when I hear your voice on the radio, I find you very fair, fair, fair and open-minded about China, so I'd like to thank you for that. Um, the, uh, I mean, I think your basic point is, uh, is actually rather important. Uh, and that is that why compare China with the United States? Because in many ways they are incomparable. They're on uh, totally different stages of their development. Of course, China is catching up the United States in lots of ways, but still in terms of GDP per head, living standards and so on, China's still way behind the United States. So if you want to make a comparison, and we, the reason why we make the comparison is exactly, well, not Eric's joke, but the, 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 re the reason why is because uh, of the uh, increasing uh, geopolitical rivalry. Uh, uh, and these kind of things have become much more common since 2016 uh, and, uh, and Trump. And I think that's why we get this kind of equation. But actually, you know, John Ross's point earlier in his contribution, which was comparing uh, China with India, after all, in 1978, the two countries were more or less uh, equal in both the size of the economy uh, and uh, GDP per head. In fact, India was slightly ahead. Um, so it, it seems to me that's, uh, uh, in terms of, because they're both developing countries, a better comparison to make uh, and a much more revealing comparison, uh, I think. Uh, but anyway, thank you for your question. Can I, can I add a point? Sure, Kishore, go ahead. Yes, uh, you know, I want to add one more criteria for assessing which societies are performing better. And I'll take it from the famous book by John Rawls called, called A Theory of Justice. And he said the society you want to be born in is a society where you didn't know whether you're gonna be in the top 10% or the bottom 10%. And so logically, you pick the society where the bottom 10% is the best off. And I think it'd be good to focus on the bottom 10%. And I say this with some personal conviction because when I was born in Singapore, Singapore was a poor third world country. I grew up in a poor third world family in a poor Singapore. I was put in a special feeding program when I was six years old. I didn't have a flush toilet. I lived with people fighting outside my door. And I can tell you, when you live in poverty, it's one of the most debilitating things that can happen to your life. The sense of hopelessness that you have is amazing. So to be able to escape from poverty and to get out of it, and the society that can do the most for these people, I would say is the most just society. And so by that criteria, if you apply, where would you want to be? You know, if you had a choice in the bottom 10%, the data shows that your chances of escaping poverty in the bottom 10% in China today are far greater than your chances of escaping poverty when you're in the bottom 10% of the United States of America. And indeed, the conditions for the bottom 10%, that's why I refer to the bottom 50%, have actually become much worse. And so I would say, in maybe the one critical, two, two words I want to add to the discussion 
now is let us focus on two words called good governance. And as a, ask a simple question, which societies are providing good governance? And the criteria I would say for the societies that are providing good governance is which societies are doing better to lift up the bottom 10%, bottom 20%, bottom 50%. And I would say that's what we should be striving to achieve. And that's how we should measure performance of societies. Um, let if me add something real that. quick to the gentleman from BBC. Um, Can I say something? Oh, okay. Eric? Yeah, yeah. If you wouldn't mind. Yeah, I, I, I think the real comparison that should be made is to a country which has been invited, which is India. Because in uh, the two countries came into their present existence at about the same time. India got independence in 1947. China got the People's Republic of China in 1949. In, in 1949, uh, China was a much poorer country than India. There were only 11 countries in the world which had a lower per capita than GDP than China at that time. Now, are you going to go to the journalist there? You're going to go to a woman in India, say she's going to live eight years less than a Chinese woman. You're going to say that she's going to be two thirds likely to be literate, whereas a Chinese woman will be literate. And to say that the Indian woman, you have eight times big, bigger chance of dying in childbirth, and you're going to seriously explain that your human rights as an Indian woman are better than your Chinese rights, uh, the, the human rights as a Chinese woman. That's not serious. Any theory which produces that conclusion is just totally wrong from the point of view of the real experience of humanity. I, I want to ask something really quick to, uh, to the question. So the gentleman from BBC, what's your name? Sorry, uh, Stephen. Stephen, I want to make a deal with you. If you're willing to consider the possibility, at least the poss or talk about, discuss the possibility that the UK could be better off and more democratic with perhaps less of the form of judicial independence and freedom of the press that you talked about, if you're willing to at least entertain the possibility conceptually, I'm willing to say that I'm willing to consider the possibility that China could be better off with a little bit more of freedom of the press and independent judiciary. All right, shall we move on? <laughs> okay, Steve. Steve Pat. your average Joes and Janes around the world, they're not going to sit around to talk about democracy or abstract concepts. Uh, you know, it, I think it is fair to say a lot of them, according to polls and surveys, are uh, that there is growing skepticism or doubts about a Chinese system uh, because it seems to be averse to uh, some of the uh, intrinsic values or concepts people associate. Uh, with not just democracy, but a good system, like transparency, like accountability, like fairness. I think, you know, and they are being reminded by news events. But the most recent example I can think of is Chinese tennis star Peng Shui. I mean, her story and allegations are being reported around the world, except here in China. And then you see people connected to the system actively eagerly promote a version of the story without making her available. I mean, don't you think this dichotomy, in a way, is uh, counterproductive to the Chinese cause and even negating to a lot of what you've been saying today? So I just want to hear you take on this. I mean, uh, I, I'm, I'm not saying the Chinese system is superior. <laughs> let's, let's set the record straight. Uh, I'm saying that at the moment, at the moment, the Chinese system seems to be delivering better outcomes for the Chinese people measured by a lot of uh, these actual uh, uh, measurements, okay? Seems to be delivering better democratic outcomes for the Chinese people than liberal regimes are delivering for their peoples at the moment, okay? Things could change, okay? And, and I actually welcome, I think the Chinese, uh, China should 
welcome a lot of the skepticism and criticism from the West. I think that actually has helped China in a, in a, in a, in a very substantial way in the past decades because they're being criticized, because they're being challenged. They are constantly under pressure to perform, to deliver. Okay, they, they have this sense of crisis all the time, Weiji, in terms of their, their legitimacy. So they resort to over-deliver, over-deliver, keep delivering, making sure the people are happy, making sure the economy's growing, making sure the poor people get lifted. Okay, uh, so, so that's, that's all good. I mean, I, I think what's not so good for liberal societies, the liberal regimes, is they're not being criticized enough. They take their legitimacy for granted. That's why I think they're declining. Um, so, I, I mean, I think we, it's better for the world that liberal democracies will come back and again deliver more democratic results. So we have more competition. Okay, and it's that competition that drove China's success in the past few decades. We don't want that to go away. So, I don't, at least. So I, I want, I mean, I, if there's a way that liberal regimes could reform and be more introspective about their failures and, 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 and the faults in their DNA, everybody's DNA has faults. Okay? Individuals have cancers, right? But if you disregard them, you say, look, you know, I'm legitimate, I'm good, I'm democratic just because I'm liberal, just because the Constitution is written this way, I, mean, I think that's really bad. Um, and we want liberal democracies to come back and deliver better. Uh, I will perhaps uh, come back to the BBC's question. You know, in, you know, we draw inspiration from Winston Churchill. He said something to the effect that liberal democracy is not that very good, but other systems are worse. So this kind of comparison, the Chinese model is okay, not very good, but in comparison with the US model, I think the Chinese model is better. This is my basic conclusion. And also, the Chinese tradition, you agree or not, is we tend to look at issues first from macro perspective, then to other details. So this overall macro perspective is very important. As I said, when you look at the political system, and its quality, and whether it can deliver to uh, the people what the people want, indeed is a balance between political power, social power, and power of capital in favor of most people or few people. That's key difference. It's not the American model of you know, division of power, judiciary, administration, legislature, but beyond that, in a society in the country, three powers overwhelmed. You could have all the independent of three branches of government, yet it's all manipulated and controlled by the power of capital. That will be a problem. So we are concerned deeply with this large picture. As for individual cases, my counsel is, you know, uh, as you know Chinese language, we have a saying, you know, uh, let the bullet fly for a while. Because the internet is a jianghu with all kinds of voices. So things will come out. Don't worry about this. China country based on rule of law. Don't worry about this. Okay, next question. Oh, um, wait, uh, Martin, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, well, I've, I've got two points to make about this question. Uh, the first is that um, why has why have attitudes in the West grown a lot more negative over the last few years towards China? This is a true. This is, a, this is absolutely true. Uh, China has become, over the last five years in my own country and even more in the United States, uh, often a toxic subject. And I don't think uh, it's very difficult to understand what's happened. I mean, there was a period when, uh, between, I would say, the turn of the century, late 90s, until, let's say, 2015, when actually, in the West, attitudes towards China were becoming more open, more curious, more interested, um, and more optimistic. What was the turning point? The turning point was the election of Trump in 2016. The whole attitude in the West 
starting with the United States, became increasingly toxic towards China. Every attempt has been made to demonize China in lots of different ways. I mean, this, this has been like a Cold War assault. And it's certainly true in my own country, in the UK. I can, you know, right across the board, more or less, even including the sort of leftist liberal papers, have become more critical of China. So this is not something particularly that is, you know, China's change. I mean, China's changed in certain ways. Yes, it's grown, it's more powerful in the world. But this attempt to degenerate, de de uh, denigrate China um, is very important uh, in, in relationship to this. And you didn't mention that. And I think that you therefore, you know, I understand your point, but you give, I think, a not an accurate picture. The second point I want to make is about China and openness. Yeah, I do think China's got a problem about a lack of openness and a lack of transparency. Um, it's certainly in that sense different from the West. And I think that as China becomes more important in the world, as it becomes a, you know, increasingly a sort of major power in the world or great, a great power in the world, then one of the things that goes with that power is the need uh, for more openness. Um, that, that, that seems to me to be something that China needs to confront. How does it deal with, well, the, the tennis player is a, a case in point because now there's a great international debate and China is silent about it. Uh, I, personally, I'm skeptical about a lot of the Western attitudes and criticisms uh, on this question, but China's voice is completely absent. And I don't think that is good for China. The second thing I'd say in relationship to this is also China's still, I think, got quite a way to go to learn how to interact with Western opinion. Um, it's still a novice, relatively speaking, in relationship to that. And so the effectiveness of China's uh, 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 response, for example, to the changed mood in the West, starting with Trump, has not been nearly as effective as it might have been. Thank you. Ari, right, next question. We have a question from our developing country press corps. Um, Eric Began from Kenya Broadcasting Corporation is asking, how exactly should democracy be perceived? I think we've addressed some of that. Um, what is the relationship between this type of democracy and the fast-paced development that China has so far attached, uh, attained? And also we have Mohammed Zamir Assad from Pakistan's Independence News Agency asking, in your opinion, how the socialist democracy system of China may offer more cooperative partnerships for partner countries in context of recent global challenges erupted through the capitalistic invasion of various countries in the last two decades? All right, who want to take a shot at those questions? Professor no, Eric. Well, I mean, back to my point is that I think the world would be better off and certainly vast majority of developing countries will be better off if they measure, define and measure demo their democracy more by outcomes than procedures. So what I think what China has done reasonably well in the past few decades is that they set goals and measure themselves against those goals, measure the outcomes against those goals, and, and, achieve, and the goals are good, which is, you know, we, we see that. If you've been in China for 20, 30 years, you know that. Um, so, so I think it's, that's, that's my point. It's more democratic if we can generate more democratic outcomes. Concerning democracy and development, I think the China is actually what call people's model. In other words, political system, democracy, or People's Congress, whatever you do, it all should end up in producing tangible benefits to the people's living standards and livelihood, both material and non-material. In other words, Chinese hate what Deng Xiaoping said, empty talks and talks and talks. We have to work and take actions. So the great strength of Chinese democracy is we can have a lot of discussions, we can have a lot of differences of views, yet at the end of the day, 
we can reach consensus and move the nation forward. So that's a key difference between the Chinese model of democracy and the Western model of democracy. One is uh, somehow a lot of discussions, a lot of voices, a lot of views, but you fail to reach consensus and society has become more and more divided. This is a problem. Then you lead to what's called populism. Yeah, it's inevitable given the rise of money, rise of social media, AI technology, Cambridge Analytica, etc. Yeah. The Chinese model is what we call the democratic centralism. You have democracy, you have a lot of discussions, but you, in the end you have also decisions. You reach consensus and move the nation forward. So the Chinese model in a way is very simple. That is, we make all kinds of surveys. Just look at the two sessions every year. Hundreds of surveys. The Chinese government at all levels are the most frequent user of opinion surveys in the world. Yeah. You can know what people want, and then you do a priority list, one, two, three, four, five, and you do accordingly. That's Chinese model. We call people's livelihood first. I think this model is also attractive to many developing countries, as we have the question from Kenya, from others. I think this is a way, I think perhaps some experience that you can uh, slightly uh, refer to uh, concerning China model. Uh, if could I possibly say something on this particular sure, developing? Go ahead. Yeah, particularly about developing countries, because we shouldn't get too carried away with the perceptions that of the West. Just looking at Europe and the United States, the biggest international poll, which is carried out almost every year, is by Pew International Research, and I just did a very simple model on that, which is I took the GDP per capita of the countries and looked how favourable they were towards China, and the richer the country was more than China, the less favorable is at this attitude. And the, le the lower the per capita GDP, that's the developing countries, the more favorable to China. I also know I used to teach um, in, in Shanghai, and I used to teach courses on China's economy for, um, for foreigners. And, and it was amazing that, for example, teaching French students, they didn't know about Chinese companies. They didn't, weren't really terribly interested. And I was teaching Nigerian students. The Nigerian students, they dashed around Shanghai. They knew the names of all the leading Chinese companies. And their, progr their program was totally simple. They wanted the capital of uh, Nigeria to be as advanced as was uh, Shanghai. And that was because, if you go back to 1960, the capital of Nigeria was much more developed than was um, Shanghai. So the perception in developing countries is very different to the perceptions which exist in developing, developed countries. So we shouldn't just make a talk, when we talk about the West, we shouldn't just be talking about the opinions in the United States and in Europe, because the, it's quite different in developing countries. Okay, anyone else? <clears throat> you know what, Eric, I want to, you know, um, ask one last question uh, to you guys, all of you. It's really a rare opportunity to have all of you here. Um, if I may, asking a question on behalf of the younger generation uh, from China and uh, you know the West and also the rest of the world, if I may, that is the gap of understanding. You know, uh, Eric, you talk about forming nuanced views instead of, instead of stereotypes. Um, but wherever you look, uh, that seems to be a tall order. I mean, in China, people always say you know, this generation of Chinese, uh, you know, a lot of them tend to be a little bit nationalistic. Uh, they have stereotypes about the West. Uh, if you look at some recent um, Chinese blockbuster movies about patriotism. And also in the West, uh, you would assume that freedom of information would give them a fairer depiction of China. This morning, I checked the highest rated cable news as of November 2021. And they are number one, The Five on Fox News. Number two, The Sean Hannity Show on Fox News. Number three, Tucker Carlson tonight on Fox News. Number four, the special report with Brett Beyer on Fox News. And number five, the Ingraham Ango Show on Fox News. My favorite guy, Chris Cuomo, um, ranks 25th. I'm a bit surprised over there. So how do you think you know, this gap of understanding uh, can be bridged among the younger generation, um, let's say, of China? Uh, let's confine it a little bit and say China and the United States. I think we're in that kind of era. I mean, anybody from Fox News here? <laughs> well, this is not a very democratic and representative set of press corps. 
So this is according to Nielsen, actually. Okay, I didn't make this up. We're getting reporters from media that's been cleaned up <laughs> rather than the winners. Um, so we need to adjust the invite list, uh, whoever is hosting this. Um, we should be speaking more to Fox. Um, I, mean, I, that, that, I mean, I think, I mean, I think Chinese, again, you know, young people, China's young people are amazing, the post 90s and post 2000 generations. They are so completely different from me, from my generation and, and, and Professor Chan's generation. Um, so they are, they grew up seeing the world, they travel around the world. Of course, they have the internet. I mean, I know that you think the internet is all closed, but of course, you know it's not. <laughs> uh, if you're here, I mean, the, the people, you know, you can't blame somebody who's in Kansas and doesn't have a passport to think that China's internet is closed off, but you guys are here. You know the Chinese young people see things around the world on the internet, okay? So they ought to go, we should encourage them to go engage with the world. Um, and, and okay, to have some fights, they feel, they have feelings, young people have, have passions. Uh, it's no big deal. Uh, some have populist impulses, some have nationalist impulses, uh, but that's okay, we should be tolerant uh, of that. Professor Zhang. And uh, indeed, this um, is interesting, you know, uh, I remember quite a few uh, US uh, politicians uh, once said or they placed a lot of hope on China's internet generation. And they assumed and believed that this internet generation, Chinese young people, will be more pro-West. Yet interestingly, this uh, Z generation uh, uh, arguably are uh, perhaps the most self-confident generation. For one thing, uh, especially in the cities, I was on most of them, but many of them traveled abroad. And uh, in my university, most undergraduate have been to abroad, as a many, quite a few countries. And they have this smartphone, which is a means of knowing the outside world. So there is, we use Marxism, this productivity, you know. Uh, the means of production has changed from PC to smartphones. In the PC era in China, Gongzi, so-called the public intellectual, the Chinese way. Uh, but uh, then with smartphones, everyone is a <laughs> newsman and he knows everything. Then the situation has changed completely. So there is a positive side, that is they know the outside world much realistically than before. So this is a positive. But there are also problems, as Eric mentioned, nationalist impulse, populist impulse, etc. But what's good about Chinese system is, as with the internet world, with any country on the internet, there are these all kinds of voices, nationalist, uh, uh, populist, in many countries already predominant. But in the case of China, at the level of decision-making process, I mentioned, it's from the people to the people, and to the people from the people, several rounds off. So I always say the decision, the quality of decision-making in China is higher. So you, this decision is much mature and sophisticated, and this is important. Even during the process of fighting this COVID, we can see very clearly, you know, in the past, our so-called uh, gongzi, uh, always see that the Western countries went through enlightenment. They are rational, scientific, you know, modern. But in the end, we find that during the process of fighting COVID, the Chinese are really more scientific, more rational, and more modern. So this will be many ways China's model is reshaping what's called the modernity. Yeah. So at the same process, we're confident that it will not be populist. Um, Kishore, I noticed that you have been quiet for a little while. Do you want to say something? No. Nope, nope. <laughs> you blacked yourself out. <laughs> Kishore, can we have Kishore back? To have one, uh, one last word? Kishore. Okay, welcome back. Kishore. You have the last word. Uh, 
um, yeah, very quickly, you know, I suspect that many people sitting in the audience may think that this discussion is a bit unbalanced because you've heard so many criticisms of the United States, you haven't heard many criticisms of China, and, and they may say, hey, this is not, this is not something that's really uh, giving us an insightful uh, perception of what the real problem is. So let me, let me, I want to make just one simple point, okay? Which is that it is almost like 99% certain that relations between China and the US will get worse in the next 10 years. There are deep historical structural forces that are driving this US-China contest, which is what the thesis of my book is, has China won. And there'll be many areas of contention. Now, if we can remove some areas of contention, then basically we get a more stable world. And one area of contention that can be removed in a very fair way, fair for the United States, fair for China, is for both sides to acknowledge that perhaps the American political system works very well for America, the Chinese political system works very well for China. And after 10 years, 20 years, we see the results. And then we can see which systems are functioning better. But what this requires, therefore, is humility on both sides, with neither side saying, my system is better than your system, and you should adopt my system and not your system. And as you know, it is a fact. I mean, it's a reality. The United States believes that democracy, American democracy, American liberal democracy, is the best form of government, it prescribes it to every country in the world. And there was a time, historical time, when history was on the side of the message. That's what end of history was all about. But in the 21st century, you're seeing the return of Asia. And here I would say very simply, ask yourself a simple question, there are about four to over four billion people in Asia, I guess, right? Most Asians would say this, huh? Okay, we respect you, United States, for your choice of government. But most Asians, including in democratic societies like India and Indonesia or, or in Southeast Asia, would say, we also respect China for its choice of governance. And, and we don't pass judgment. We don't say the American system is inherently better than the Chinese system. And we don't say the Chinese system is inherently better than the American system. So if you can have a position of just live and let live in the areas of governance, you take away a major sore point in US-China relations and you create a better and safer and less dangerous world. All right, live and let live. Uh, well said, uh, Kishore, thank you very much. John, Martin, Eric, and Professor Lee, I want to thank all of you for being part of the discussion today. And thank you all for being here, joining us on site. And those online via Zoom, thank you all very much. I hope you have enjoyed this discussion and debates as much as I have. Thank you for being here. Hopefully, we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.